Hello, Pastor Gavin Whitcomb here from Moores Mountain Church near Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. You ready to dig into the Word? Let's pray. Father in heaven, without you we can do nothing of eternal significance or relevance. So we ask you to lead us and guide us as we study your Word for your glory. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, today's Bible study is uh, John chapter 13. This is the end of the chapter. And uh, Jesus reveals his departure. He's going to be leaving the disciples. And and he talks about the new commandment. And he uh, reveals that Peter will deny him. Okay, so there are things that we can learn from this passage of Scripture. Let me read it for you. Now, therefore... When he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while am I with you. Ye shall seek me, and I, as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Now, our scripture reading this morning uh, continues the narrative of Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples. And this is on the night in which he would be arrested and his crucifixion would take place the next day. So Jesus is talking with his disciples and Judas had just left to go to betray Jesus. And and so so Jesus said, Now therefore when, uh, therefore when he, that's Judas, was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway, that means immediately, glorify him. Okay, now, um, the atonement of Christ and his resurrection that would provide salvation to all who would believe has now begun at this point. So that's why he says, now is the Son of Man glorified. Well, how could the Son of Man be glorified when he's going to be betrayed and then they're going to crucify him and put him on the cross and kill him? Well, uh, he would be uh, glorified in bringing about the plan of salvation. And so Jesus' full and complete obedience to the will of the Father and bringing about our salvation, that would glorify the Father. But the Father would also glorify the Son uh, and raise him from the dead and restore him to his place at the right hand of the Father in heaven. So, so Jesus would glorify the Father, the Father, for, Father would glorify the Son, and God would get the glory through it all. Now, what does it mean when, God, when Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him, and if God be glorified in him, he'll, he'll glorify him, in himself. Well, you see, when it talks about to glorify here in this passage means that God reveals or manifests or displays his attributes, his greatness, his power, his wisdom, his love, mercy, and grace. God reveals and makes known his, uh, his attributes, and it results in praise and honor going to the Lord. Praise and honor from whom? Well, from, you know, millions of humans who will come to a saving knowledge of Christ and receive eternal life. So they will praise God for his righteousness and his glory, his majesty, his goodness, mercy, and grace. But not only that, but the angels of God in heaven 
who are watching what's taking place on the earth, they're going to glorify God as well. You know, in Romans 3, 24 through 26, it says that, uh, that, that through Christ and what he did on the cross for us, God could be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. And so, you know, uh, God found a way through the atonement of Christ that he could still show mercy and grace to sinners, even though we're unworthy, without compromising his righteousness and his justice. He could still be just uh, in forgiving sinners because Christ paid for our sins. Now, the display of God's attributes in the redemption of sinners, that's going to result in praise to God both by men and angels. In, in Ephesians 3.10, it says that under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known or manifested the wisdom of God. You know, in 1 Peter 1.12, it talks about salvation and the gospel. And it says, which things the angels desire to look into. Now think about that. The angels are fascinated by God's plan of redemption for the human race. So they, they desired to, uh, to look into this. So Jesus announced that he would be leaving them. So that, that's what this is about. You know, the Son of Man is going to be glorified, and, you know, the, the Father will glorify the Son, the Son will glorify the Father. They're going to glorify one another, and God will be glorified by displaying his attributes, his righteousness, and his justice, but also his mercy and grace and wisdom will be manifest through the plan of salvation. So it's ready to begin with Judas going and uh, betraying Christ. Now, verse 33, Jesus says, little children, by the way, that's not a put down, that's a term of endearment. Yet a little while I am with you, you shall seek me and as I said to the Jews, the same thing I told the Jews, where, where I'm go whether I go, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. So I'm telling you the same thing I told the Jews. I'm going to be leaving you. And you can't come with me where I'm going. At least not right now. So in, in verses 34 and 35, he says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, how is that a new commandment? I mean, doesn't the Old Testament scriptures tell us, like in Leviticus, you know, it says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart, you know, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Even says that about the foreigner and the stranger. Love him as yourself. So, if you love your neighbor as yourself, and everybody's supposed to do that, you're going to love one another. So how is that anything new? Well, it's new in the sense that Jesus said uh, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So so the new aspect was there to love one another the, the way that Christ has loved us. Now, what what kind of love did Christ show towards us? towards the disciples and towards us, that he wants them, and by extension, of course, he wants us to emulate in our lives. Well, in uh, 1 John, he talks about loving one another and giving of ourselves one for another. The, the kind of love that, that Christ shown was, first of all, a forgiving love and a patient love, right? Remember how patient he was with his disciples? And... Uh, the, the Bible says that we are to be forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. The scriptures tell us that Christ loved the church. And uh, how did Christ love the church? Well, he gave himself for it, right? And in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, it says that we are to be imitators of God or followers of God as dear children, and love one another as Christ also hath loved us, and given himself for us a sweet-smelling savor unto God. Okay, so love one another as Christ loved us. He gave himself for us. 
Not only that, but Christ loved the church and the disciples in spite of their sins. So we got to love one another. You're not going to meet perfect people. Uh, um, you and I are not perfect, right? We have our flaws and failures and weaknesses and imperfections because we're human. So we need to love uh, one another in spite of our sins, in spite of our faults. That's how Christ loved the church. But uh, his love is also uh, Christ's love, the way he loved us, is a serving love. Remember, he washed the disciples' feet, and he said, you know, you ought to wash one another's feet. Not literally, but, you know, that, that act of serving one another. And then his love was, of course, a sacrificial love. So that's the way that God calls us to, uh, to love one another. So this love is to be displayed towards everybody, but especially between believers. In fact, in verse 35, he says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Do you know if you read the book of 1 John, it says, uh, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So, it's impossible to be born again and not have love in your heart for other people, especially for other believers. So, um, by this we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren, that says in First John. So, uh, this is going to be a sign to everyone that we are followers of Christ. So, when unbelievers look at us uh, and, and they see how we love one another, they're going to think, wow, they, hey, they must be followers of Jesus. Okay, now, notice then in verse 36, Simon Peter, he, he seems to like kind of ignore what Jesus said. I mean, this is, this is a major thing that Jesus was emphasizing uh, at the Last Supper. Here's a new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. Well, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, Whither goest thou? You know, where are you going? You, you, you mentioned that you were going to be leaving us and we can't come with you. Where are you going? Why can't I follow thee now? And, and in fact, Jesus said, I will lay, or Peter said to Jesus, I will lay down my life for thy sake. Now, we all know what happened. And Jesus says here, Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto you, before the cock shall, uh, 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 he says, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So if the cock begins to crow in the morning, uh, before morning light, you will have denied me three times. So we know what happened. Peter says, I'll, I, I'll go with you and now I'll lay down my life for you. And other gospels, Jesus said, you know, uh, Peter, you're going to deny me. And he says, no, I, I, I never would do that. Well, what happened? Well, just like Jesus said, Peter ended up denying the Lord. Now, um, in verse 38, or, or, or verse, uh, excuse me, verse 33, Jesus said, whither I go, Ye cannot come, so now I say to you. But in uh, verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now. Now Jesus was going to heaven, right? But he said to Peter, You can't follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Okay, so you can't go with me now there. You can't follow me. But afterwards, at a later time, you're going to follow me there uh, where I'm going, which, of course, would be to heaven. Okay, so, and uh, so, you know, the scriptures tell us in, in the end of the book of John that uh, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, the day's coming when you are going to stretch out your hands and they are going to carry you where you, when you're an old man, they're going to carry you where you don't want to go. In other words, they were going to, 
carry him away and kill him. He would be martyred. And Jesus, just like Jesus said, he did, in fact, Peter did die by stretching out his hands. He was crucified upside down, according to tradition, and I think that that tradition is probably correct. And uh, so uh, that's, that's how Peter died, and eventually he did follow him afterwards. Now, when Jesus said, Peter, you can't follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards, Jesus' words to Peter uh, are saying, Peter, you'll be in heaven with me after you die. When you die, you'll come up to heaven to be with me. You know, this refutes the idea of soul sleep and affirms that believers in Christ have a waking conscious existence in heaven with the Lord while awaiting the resurrection of life. Now, there's some groups that uh, teach soul sleep. The Bible doesn't teach that. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, afterwards you'll be there where I am. And uh, you know, if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, the Apostle Paul is talking about those which are asleep in Jesus. And by that he means they're dead, but they're dead in Christ. Okay, he says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, now listen to this. Don't don't miss this. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So where is Jesus now? He's in heaven at the right hand of the Father, right? So when Jesus returns, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with with him. Uh, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Okay, so when Christ returns, he's coming down from heaven, and I believe this this refers to the rapture, obviously. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him, right? So them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Well, if God's going to bring them with him, that means that they're in heaven now. And so the, really that uh, conclusion, it is uh, really inescapable. Okay, now, Second <clears throat> uh, Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8, the Apostle Paul says, We are confident, knowing that, now he says, knowing that, right? We're confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, that's the way the Apostle Paul spoke. Why? He didn't believe in soul sleep. If he would have believed in soul sleep, he wouldn't have said that. But he said, hey, while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. We're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And in Philippians 1 Verses 21 through 24, the Apostle Paul said, To me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, why would it be gain to die? Well, because, hey, it's great living for Christ, but to die is even better because you go to be with the Lord. He says, But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. In other words, if I keep living in the flesh, in my earthly, bodily existence, materially here on earth, I'll continue to get more fruit uh, for the Lord, gather and produce more fruit. But he says, yet what I shall choose, I what not. I'm in a straight between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Now, the Apostle Paul was not speaking purely hypothetically. He was speaking of it in terms of certainty. He said, hey, right now to abide in the flesh is more needful to you, but you know, I, I don't know whether I'd rather depart and be with Christ or stay here. I mean, to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's not the way that somebody talks who believes in soul sleep. Uh, so um, here we find that Peter uh, is told by Christ you can't follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Okay, now, 
back to Peter, saying, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'm gonna lay, I will lay down my life for thy sake. And Jesus says, well, you're going to deny me three, to three times. You know, there, there's a lesson that we can learn from Peter here. Peter's heart was in the right place, right? And he, but, but you see, he was overconfident in his own strength, and he us, underestimated his own weakness. And if we're overconfident in our own strength, and we underestimate our own weakness, then that leaves us vulnerable to sin. So later Jesus' words to Peter, what Jesus just told Peter, they would suddenly pull the rope that will ring the bell of Peter's conscience, to put it in the words of uh, William Hendrickson. There's a lesson to be learned from Peter's failure. You know, 1 Corinthians ten twelve says it this way, Let him that thinketh he standeth, Take heed, lest he fall. Let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. Now what does that mean? That means if you think you stand, you think that you can't sin, you think you can't fall into sin, uh, you better be careful. Because when you get overconfident like that, and cocky and arrogant, and you're not trusting in the Lord and his strength and his wisdom, and you underestimate your own weakness, uh, you are in danger to, of falling into sin. So let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Uh, you know, um, in Ephesians 6 verses 10 and 11, it says, Be strong in the Lord, right? And in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So it's God's power and his strength that we trust in and rely on to get victory over sin and to victoriously face temptation. Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Okay, so I can do all things through Christ, right? So we can't forget that. Uh, if we're walking around trusting in our own strength and our own power uh, to overcome temptation, um, we leave ourselves vulnerable to sin. We need God's help. Um, in, in Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, it talks about Jesus. It says, you know, we don't have a high priest who can't be touched with the feelings of our weaknesses, our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may find mercy and grace to help in time of need. So, uh, you know, we ought to be praying if we're tempted. So, you know, the, the point is, we need to be careful about saying things like, I could never do that. You know, if we hear about somebody really messing up their life and falling into sin, we need to be careful about saying, I could never do that. We could say, I would never want to do that. And boy, I, I, would, I hope I never do anything like that. But we need to be careful about saying, I, I could never do that. Because that overconfidence and our own strength uh, could leave us weak and vulnerable. And... Uh, we could underestimate the enemy. We could underestimate the power of sin or the power of the flesh or the power of temptation. And, uh, you know, um, overconfidence uh, in our own strength, that, you know, that can cause us to get too close to temptations that we should be running from. There's some temptations in Scripture where the Bible says flee. You know, like it says, flee fornication. Flee youthful lusts. Flee idolatry. So, um, you know, it's, it's dangerous. Uh, th there are some people that they, they spend, they're, they're godly Christians, but they spend a little too much time hanging around the wrong crowd. And uh, you need to be careful. Or, you know, a lot of people get sucked into sin. And, uh, you know, at first they say, oh, I... <laughs> That 
that's no problem for me. Uh, I'm never going to do that. Or I could never fall into that. And uh, they end up doing it. So, you know, it's better to, to not only avoid sin, but avoid situations where we are tempted to sin. And if you have a weakness, then you need to avoid being tempted in that area. Uh, someone once said it this way, that it's uh, it's better to avoid the ditch than to fall into it and have to find a way to climb out. So it's wise to not only avoid sin, but avoid temptation. But some people get so close to temptation, and it's like there's a cliff. If there's a cliff and you, you would fall off and kill yourself, why stay close to the cliff? Why get as close to that cliff as you can get? Wouldn't it make sense to like stay far away from it? So if you have a weakness and a sin that you're dealing with or some struggle... Uh, stay away from not only that sin, but the temptation itself. So beware of overconfidence in our own strength and underestimating our weakness like Peter did. You know, Proverbs fourteen sixteen says this, A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but a fool rageth and is confident. So, uh, he says, hey, a wise man fears and departs from evil. Do you know when I was a young guy, I remember sometimes I would be in stupid situations where uh, there would be temptation and maybe hanging around the wrong crowd. And uh, sometimes if, if they would want you to do something and you were afraid to do it because it was stupid and you were afraid you'd get in trouble or, or hurt yourself, uh, you would say, no, I don't want to do it. And they'd say, oh, you chicken, and mock you because you were afraid to do wrong. Do you know, the Bible says if you're afraid to do wrong, it's a sign of wisdom. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil. So we should be afraid of evil because we recognize that not only does it displease God, but it could be disastrous to our life and the lives of those around us. So uh, don't be overconfident and overly cocky to where we don't rely on God. Uh, beware of overconfidence. That's the lesson we learn from Peter's error. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you with favor. May he lead you and guide you in the way of peace and fill your heart overflowing with his love and may he give you confidence in himself and victory to an ever-increasing degree over temptation. God bless you.